Today in the EU. Inside Hungary's turbulent first 10 days leading the EU Council presidency. EU ambassadors met yesterday to prepare a joint response after President Viktor Orban's unexpected visit to negotiate peace with Putin. The amicable nature of the dialogue between the two leaders in Moscow upset EU ambassadors. What can EU countries do about Orban's Russian ties? Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Jada Santana, and this is Today in the EU. Don't expect the Hungarian standpoint, the national perspective on things to change just because of the presidency. Being an honest broker doesn't mean that you have to uh, give, uh, give up your own position. This was Zoltan Kovacs, the government commissioner of the Hungarian presidency. He says being an honest broker doesn't mean giving up your position. But doesn't it? As EU officials condemn yet another example of Orbán's proximity to Russia, trust in Hungarian leadership is fizzling. To discuss the EU strategy 10 days in the Hungarian Council's presidency, I'm joined in the studio by Alexandra Bzozowski. Hi, Alex. Hello. Hungary's Prime Minister Viktor Orbán has been quite active recently. He first visited Kiev and then traveled to Moscow last Friday, meeting with Russia's President Vladimir Putin. And he also he also visited China. Alex, the optics are fairly bad from Brussels, right? Indeed, they're not great. But first of all, I think also the timing is quite interesting for that kind of shuttle diplomacy. And how so? It comes really just a few days after Budapest took over the EU's rotating presidency. So Mm -hmm. for EU diplomats watching that, um, there's no doubt that there's a clear link between the presidency and what Prime Minister Orban has branded as a peace mission to those three countries. But EU leaders and officials have in recent days been quite unanimous in condemning the surprise visit to Moscow. They were stressing that Budapest was not acting on behalf of the bloc as a whole. Mm -hmm. So... There is a bit of ambiguity. And after that visit to Moscow, the Hungarians also said they would understand that it doesn't have a European mandate. However, for some of the communication from those visits on the social media messages and videos, there was the EU presidency logo with the rubric scoop that was presented a few days ago. So there was a bit of ambiguity there, whether this is a presidency trip or not. I mean, some of the statements that Orban gave in Moscow seem to confirm his visit as a European ambassador rather than a national president, he said, Hungary is slowly becoming the only country in Europe that can speak to everyone. I would like to use this occasion to speak about important issues, and I would like to know your opinion on issues that are important for Europe. Orban himself has explained his initiative uh, was aimed to merely collect information about the situation, at least that's what his chief foreign policy advisor told us last week. And then he wanted to report back to your member states what happened. And this was supposed to happen yesterday um, at the level of uh, EU ambassadors. And they were holding an ad hoc debate on that matter of the visits. But at the same time, and I think that's why, why the optics might be also particularly bad, Putin, while in public comments before meeting Orban, said exactly that, that he expected Orban to outline the position of European partners on Ukraine. So in some way, this gave the Russian side exactly what they wanted for their propaganda. And yet the Hungarians have made a solid effort to downplay concerns, maintaining that the presence of the logo was of little importance and that they are committed to their position, while also making clear that the country has a national political agenda. This is another extract from Zoltan Kavaks. I told you that the Prime Minister is going to use the presidency uh, in a political way. So there's a political agenda next to what is expected from a member state and running uh, the presidency of the council. How common is this type of statement? Normally, if you're at the head of the EU presidency, you keep your business very separate. Right. So Mm. what we saw over the past few years with the Belgians, I think primarily with the Swedes, there's a clear separation. So as it works normally in the room, the presidency is chairing all council constellations except the Foreign Affairs Council, which is chaired by the US top diplomat Burrell. But in those other council meetings, they're the chairman and they're the facilitator. So in many ways, they keep 
their own national position very much apart from what the general lead of the discussion is. However, in those cases, they can separate and say, we as, as the chair and we as the presidency are the honest broker. They can stand up and say, but speaking mm-hmm. as the country, this is our position. However, normally this is not really happening very often unless it's a very, very controversial case. So normally the presidency is really, really trying to be the honest broker and not pushing an agenda through the presidency um, as such that would cause a backlash, right? I mean, there can be cases of that, but I think normally you would try to be really as consensual as possible. Right. So Orban move was rather unconventional. How can we then frame his tour? How can we understand it? I think it's relatively hard to say what did he try to achieve with the, with the visit still. Hungary has said they wanted to sound out how close the positions of Russia and Ukraine are for a potential ceasefire in the conflict. But reality is that they are extremely far apart, and even more so probably after that hideous Russian missile attack on uh, the children's hospital in Kiev earlier this week. So in some way, that can also be read as a response by Moscow that they're not willing to back down in any case after that visit. And the fact that that came before a crucial NATO meeting in Washington this week that was supposed to pledge and still will pledge in the next days. More support to Ukraine is quite seen as a clear message here in Washington. Indeed, Orban has maintained a rather strong relationship with Putin, but is he the only one that met with the Russian president after the invasion of Ukraine? No, he is not. Indeed, not the only one. So there was a first visit by a European leader to Moscow, which was the Austrian Chancellor Karl Nehammer, who visited uh, Moscow in 2022. However, the context was very different. His trip came only two months after Russia started its war. And back then, as we as we remember, it was just around the time of the Russian advance on Kiev. And there was a public debate also about the Russian atrocities um, in Moscow targeting civilians. So that was just coming up. And, and that was a relatively strong debate back then. So the framing from Vienna was very different and mostly in that light. Nehammer had visited Ukraine and Bucha before where Ukrainian troops had just retaken the city on the outskirts of Kiev. And after the Russian occupation, they found the mass grave sites that were later attributed to Russian war crimes by international investigators. So Nehammer then went to confront Putin, as he said. Um, Although the visit was quite divisive back then, it was seen in a very different light. I mean, Austria Mm -hmm. is military neutral, but its government has vocally joined any European partners in condemning Russia's invasion quite vocally. So Hungary, on the other hand, when we see the context of the past month, there is a growing discontent with its position towards Russia, also due to the frequent shuttle diplomacy of some Hungarian officials. I mean, we see that, for example, the foreign minister is traveling to Moscow quite often, but also this is seen in the context of Hungary obviously blocking a series of foreign policy decisions on Ukraine over the past years. And I think that this content is moving towards also a bit more of a security debate at the moment. What we've seen also in the past weeks and months was that Hungary is not really seen as an EU partner you can trust. And, and more and more yeah. new diplomats are actually saying that. So there is a bit of a concern with the elephant in the room, let's say, when you talk about very sensitive security um, decisions. There's also a second visit to raise eyebrows around Brussels, which is the meeting Orban had with Xi Jinping in China. However, former Belgian President De Croo and German President Schultz also visited the country this year. Do you think that the lack of trust has created a certain bias against the Hungarian leader? Yes, absolutely. But I think in that sense, everybody is very careful to campaign China and Russia with each other. I mean, let's not forget that Russia is waging an illegal war against a neighboring Mm -hmm. country and breaking international law on probably hundreds of accounts. Plus, Putin has been declared a pariah for the atrocities that Russia is committing. So there is an international criminal court arrest warrant against him. So China is definitely not in that league um, where I would really make the distinction still. And I think that's that's also the reading um, that most member states currently have. Plus, I think, on the other hand, having EU leaders like the Kroen Scholz visit China, it's usually on the account of multiple issues, right? We, mm-hmm. we see the delegations traveling with them. It's mostly economic. Of course, it's political. Of course, it's geopolitical as well. But it's more in the context of a, you know, a whole approach towards China. Here, the clear purpose was 
a peace mission and essentially Orban kind of agreeing to what China has presented as a peace plan for Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. which is contested by Kiev and which um, is not really seen as the peace plan that is supposed to help ending the war. It's an idea. The Chinese are very outward going when trying to mediate in the conflict, but in some way, they're not seen as the honest brokers by the Ukrainians. And uh, I think there's a lot of hesitancy from that Zelensky's team as well. And in some way, it just quite doesn't sit right with uh, European countries that see these visits happening without having a united position on that. Right. As you mentioned, Orban's initiatives didn't sit right with EU ambassadors that had a meeting on this matter yesterday. What was on the table? Indeed. Uh, so there was a first step by, by member states yesterday who were seeking clarity about the contents of, of Orban's trips. But that discussion was also part, again, of that longer story of discontent. So as we remember back in May, EU member states for the first time had openly vented the anger with Hungary and its pattern of the behavior, as they called it, especially of like increasingly blocking you from policy decisions and again, preventing progress on crucial aid to Ukraine. So in some way, that has moved now to the stage where there is an actual discussion about it. So some EU diplomats over the past weeks already were saying that this might require discussion about practical changes to the bloc's decision-making processes. So now after the Moscow visit, some have started going further and saying there needs to be some reining in and into that destructive behavior. And so what can the EU do to actually prevent such behavior? What kind of actions could be put into place? Actively, I think currently there's not much that can be done as, again, foreign policy remains the prerogative of every member state as a sovereign country. But what we've seen in the past is that obviously there's an increasing 26 versus one mentality, especially on Ukraine. Um, and that has made some people think. So there is a few things that are being discussed between member states. It's a relatively loose discussion, as we understand it for now. Some diplomats say it would not be unthinkable that some of the high-level meetings um, planned to take place in Budapest in the next six months in the framework of the presidency could be either reduced in attendance or full-out boycotted. The European Commission already last week put into question their traditional visit to Hungary, where normally the College of Commissioners travels um, to the respective host country, and that was expected to take place after the summer break. So There is a bit of ambiguity whether it will happen or not, but there is serious consideration maybe to either scale it down as well or even you know call it off in some way. So it's likely we could see more of those kind of actions that are more symbolic. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, if you have a presidency, a new presidency as a country, you kind of do want to be successful. So of it course. would have quite an impact on maybe also the domestic uh, debate in, in Hungary. One of the options that has been put on the table is the boycott of the council's presidency in formal meetings. Would it be only a symbolic move or could it have a concrete backlash? Hungarian officials actually this week already downplayed the importance of those decisions. But um, obviously, I think when it comes to the loss of prestige, they're quite worried about that as well. Maybe not communicating that openly, but um, at least in considerations of you know, the big meetings that are supposed to happen in the next part of the year, which is a big summit. The EU summit is supposed to take place in October in Budapest. An EPC summit, European Political Community Summit, which would see 44, 45 plus countries coming to Budapest back to back to that EU summit. So it is a huge deal, right? So the prestige loss, if suddenly um, some member states would say, well, we just sent lower representation would be actually quite big. However, I think it's maybe a bit too early to really think about um, a potential backlash, right? So what we will have to see is in the next few weeks, in what sense some of the informal ministerial meetings that are supposed to take place in Hungary will be attended. We already saw one case with uh, the Competitiveness Council this week where we had some ministers not in attendance. Whether that is a clear boycott or not, and whether the Hungarians might actually address it, um, is another question. Thank you, Alex. I'm Jada Santana, and this was Your Activist Today in the EU podcast. Visit Your Active to stay on top of the latest news, sign up for our podcast newsletter, 
And if you haven't subscribed yet, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Leave us a star review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite streaming platform. It will really help us spread the word about our work. This episode was produced by Miriam Sanz de Tejada, Nicoletta Yonta, and me. Additional reporting by Nathan Kenes and Paul Messed. As part of our commitment to accuracy, inclusion, and transparency, your active is part of the Trust Project.